Let's pray. Father, that's quite an amazing promise that you'll never let go of us, that you care that much about us. Lord, I pray today, Lord, as we open up your word, let us see the hope that only you can give, Lord. Open the eyes of our heart today, Lord. Speak to us, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to dismiss the teens at this time. If you're a teenager and you'd like to join them, they do have a class during this service, so you're welcome to join them. And um, welcome to New Branch. We are so happy that you're here. If this is your first time, we do have a gift for you at the Welcome Center, so please pick that up. And uh, we're happy that you're here. We'd also like to take just a moment to welcome those that are joining us online and by phone today. We have several people that do that, and you guys are welcome to the service today. Let me ask you a question. When did darkness become our friend? Huh? That, that might feel like a strange question, huh? When did darkness become it? When you were a child, how many people had night lights? I see all the men. No, 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 don't need it. Don't need it. Get it. Uh, some of you, I know you're not telling me the truth. I've been camping with some of you guys <laughs> at Merchant Mill Pond. I get that you know, some of y'all still need. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but as a child, you know, it helped us. The light was our friend, right? Because it helped us from imaginary monsters and leaving the light on. But as we got older, the real monsters in life, and some of us can relate to this, we realized our, our thoughts and our habits. And that darkness became our friend because what? Because we wanted to hide in the darkness, right? That, that, that the, the hope was this, is that we hoped that nobody would really know what's going on. If we hide over here and the spotlight's not on us, then maybe nobody would know. You get the idea? Anybody feel that? Anybody feel that way? That it's like, if, if I could, let me, let me put it a different way. If I could take your thoughts, and I had a machine, and we have one like that. If I had a machine that could project your thoughts right up here, right now. <laughs> how many wish it would go dark? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's right. That's a scary thought, isn't it? Today we're going to talk about a man in the Bible. His name is Nicodemus. And uh, he has kind of a strange name, but, but his name is Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a Pharisee, which is one of the religious rulers of that day. And we kind of make them the villain oftentimes because they are. <laughs> but, but, but he wasn't a bad guy. He was, he was a good man. He was trying to do the right thing. He was, he was living his life in a good way. Most people would have thought Nicodemus has it all together. That's what they would have thought. And rightly so. But he came to Jesus to ask Jesus a question. And his question was this, is there a faith that does not depend upon my performance. I really, that's, if, if I were to summarize what Nicodemus was asking, that's kind of what he was going to ask Jesus. He was coming to him at night, and he came and he said, Jesus, is there a faith that doesn't depend on my performance? You see, he was a little bit scared. As a Pharisee, everything that they did was based on external performance. Their, their faith, their assurance of faith, if I'm keeping the faith, I can tell you, it was based on their external performance and Nicodemus, as good as he was, had some doubts. And he was coming to Jesus going, I don't know exactly who you are. We'll get into that in a minute. But, but, but he was going, I just have a feeling maybe you know something I don't. I see it in your disciples. I see some different things happening. And maybe you might have the answer. And I'm a little afraid. What is it going to take? And he asked Jesus the question. Maybe you're thinking the same thing. Nicodemus was stuck. He might not have looked like it from the outside, but on the inside he was stuck. We're in a message series called Unstuck. How, how, how does God get us spiritually unstuck? If you're here today and you feel stuck, you couldn't have picked a better Sunday. And I know a lot of people are stuck right now. We're going to take a look today at two different equations. Now, how many enjoyed math in high school? Anybody make a career out of math? I see, Bert, you're not raising your hand. That's okay. He's a CPA. <laughs> okay. Anyway. <laughs> Some of us enjoy math, some of us don't, but this is very simple algebra. My son's taking algebra. He doesn't really enjoy it, but, but there's one simple thing about algebra. It's very simple. Whatever's on this side of the equation <laughs> has to equal on this side. Now, I know that the government doesn't get that. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> Sorry. That's my only political joke. Okay. <laughs> but one plus one equals two, right? I mean, if it's two on this side, it's got to be two on this side. Somehow it's got to equal up. You get it? We're going to talk about two equations today. One of them doesn't add up. And I kind of have a feeling that that's, that was part of the problem for Nicodemus is, is that he was, he, his life was through this paradigm of this is the way it's supposed to be, but he had the wrong equation. He had something that didn't add up. And then we're going to talk about something that does add up, one that gets you stuck, one that gets you unstuck. We're going to talk about it. So we're going to read the story. It's kind of a lengthy story. I cannot unpack the whole thing today. I wish I could. Um, unless you guys have 10 hours, I'd be happy to do that. I'm thrilled with it, but not as 
some of you are already looking for the door. Okay, John chapter 3. You can pull out your outlines or follow along with me in your Bibles. We're going to start with verse 1. It says this, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are the teacher who comes from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if they were not from him. And Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, and the Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you are born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This, this is an amazing passage. I, I'd, I'd ask you to go back and read it again when you get some time. It's, it is unbelievable, the things that are taught here. But today we're going to focus on Nicodemus, because I think we find a man who is struggling as some of us are struggling. He, he was struggling as he came to Christ, as he doubted himself. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a hard place to be. Where he's going, I know from the outside, and I know people look up to me, but if they really knew what was going on on the inside, they would know that I'm scared, and that's why I'm coming to Jesus. And he came at night because he had enough political stuff about him that he understood, I can't go against the Pharisees. The Pharisees really don't believe this guy. But I think that he might have some truth, and so I'm going to come at night, I'm going to sneak over here, and I'm going to ask him the question because it's burning so hard. You know it must be burning hard if a Pharisee would come to Jesus and say, hey, i got a question for you. And as usual, Jesus' teaching did not make sense to him. We saw that last week. If you didn't hear last week's message, I forgot to say this first service, but um, John Dietrich had burned some copies of it. So if you'd like a CD of it, we have a CDs out there. Um, so we'll see if anybody wants that. You're welcome to do that. Um, but, but we talked last week about a lady and Jesus said, hey, you can have living water. And, um, and the thing is, is that she didn't get it. She's like, living water, what does that mean? And the same thing you see with Nicodemus. He said, I'm going to give you an analogy. And he said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is going, can I, can I enter back into the womb again? What is going on? And, and so what I want to be clear on is, is Jesus is not a poor communicator. It's that the person he's communicating to has a broken paradigm. I don't know if that makes sense. What he has functioned to see, his paradigm of life, how he sees life, is totally opposite of Jesus. So when Jesus said it, it's just kind of like, I don't understand. What are you talking about? See, that's what was wrong with Nicodemus. And that's what's wrong with a lot of us. It's the reason why some of us are stuck today. And I'd like to give you the first equation. This is the one that doesn't add up. And I think it's important because some of us might be stuck right here. Some of us might be saying something different, but if we were really truthful, (laughs) we believe this equation. You want to know what it is? To be a Christian, you want to know what it equals? On on this side is Christianity, but what plus what equals Christianity? 
what they believe as Pharisees and what many of us believe is this. A lot of people I talk to, legalism plus works equals Christianity. In their case, they didn't believe in Christ because they didn't believe that he was the Christ. They believed to be right with God, you had to have legalism. You had to follow certain rules. You had to be right. You had to do works. You had to do that, and that equals being right with God. But just like we saw with Nicodemus and just like most of us have seen, our lives don't quite add up. And so when it comes to light, when it comes to Christ, when it comes to looking at this thing that he's talking about, our lives don't add up. And so it brings fear, doesn't it? It brings guilt is what it does. I don't know if anybody's been trapped in that. My life doesn't add up. It keeps us from God. It keeps us from other things. And it makes us afraid of light. When we talk about light today, we're talking about truth. We're talking about standing in front of God. And you know how I know that? Because most of the people I talk to, if I were to say, do you believe in God, they'd say yes. If I said, are you right with God, they might say yes. If I said, if you were to die today and you're standing before God, how does that feel? What do you think he knows when he shines his spotlight of everything he knows about you? How do you feel about that? I feel afraid. I'm scared to death. I have no idea what he's going to say if I was really truthful and I feel guilty. And can I tell you something? Guilty people do strange things, don't they? Guilty people act weird. When it comes to this particular thing, you can act all kinds of ways. Some people deal with it by going, I'm just guilty and I'm a worm and I'm terrible. And other people deal with it like this. I'm not so bad. I'm going to cover that up. And some people put on a nice disguise. That's what the Pharisees did. I'm going to file 700 and some laws, but on the inside, I know I'm not quite right. <laughs> I don't get the spirit of the law, but I get the letter of the law, and that's what they did. And the problem for them was they were guilty, and guilty people do it. And maybe you've noticed it. Have you ever noticed it? You've been around somebody with a guilty heart. What are they like? You're not going to get close to me. Maybe you didn't know that's what it is, right? You didn't know what was keeping you back from that person. But the truth is, is oftentimes when you come up against a barrier and when you start getting close to them, they react in strange ways, don't they? All of a sudden, it's like the incredible hawk just came out. You know, it's like, blah. You're like, what? where did that come from? What are you doing? Because they're guilty, right? They're trying to hide it. They get very defensive. And it's the reason why we understand that one equation that doesn't add up is if you want to be a Christian, it cannot be legalism plus works. It doesn't work. It doesn't add up. But that's how Nicodemus saw it. And if you do, you're going to be stuck. The other one is this, is forgiveness. We go, I know I don't add up, so how can I be forgiven? This is one that I always get. How can I get to heaven? I get that one a lot. If I do enough good, it might outweigh the bad. You get the idea? Good works plus performance does not equal forgiveness, no matter how you slice it. But that's most of the religions of the world. It's most of the people I talk to, even the ones that go to church that tell me, if I said, hey, are you, are, are you going to heaven? You know what they would tell me? I hope so. I hope I've done enough. I know I did this one bad thing. I don't know. Because they still think that being forgiven has to do with them doing some sort of penance or them working their way. And it makes sense because in their mind they're going, how do I equal this out? I did bad. How do I do good? How do I do enough good to equal that out? But it doesn't add up. And we'll be stuck. The other one is faith. How do you have faith? You know, people speak of faith in strange terms. I'll go ahead and give you the equation. Rules plus self-control does not equal faith. Rules plus self-control does not equal faith. <laughs> we have songs about it, right? Keeping the faith. I'm keeping the faith. It has to do with work. Don't it? I'm going to muster up enough stuff. I'm going to start doing the right thing. I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep the faith. I'm going I'm to keep striving for faith. You get the idea? That's how they see faith. And if that's how you see it, no wonder we're messed up and we see that. Because the gravitational pull of all religion, you know what it is? It's rule keeping. Guys. It's rule keeping, not relationship building. And we see it more clearly with the Pharisees than anyone else. Nicodemus would understand this more than anyone else. It's not how I treat you. As long as I dot all my I's and cross all my T's, you don't matter. And you don't fit my paradigm. You, I don't, it doesn't matter how I treat you. And when Jesus came, it really tweaked them because they were like, well, he's kind of not listening to us, and we keep all the rules. But we don't care how we treat people, you see. And he was going around saying things like, they would say, what is the greatest law? And he'd say, well, let me explain it to you. Let me explain the law. And they would be like, you're going to explain the law to us? Yeah. Because you're trying to follow the law, but you don't get the reason. You think you got the letter of the law, but you're missing what's behind the law, the reason for the law. It's how you treat people. And he said that, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as your health self. All the laws of the prophets hang on these two. That has to do with how you treat people. The rules are in place. Are the rules not important? Yes, they are. But you've let them take on a life of their own, and you forgot what's behind it. You forgot the spirit of the law. Guys, 
That's why he says in John 13, 34, a new command I give to you. You would think that would be one that you would go, this is going to be profound. A new command? Love one another as I have loved you. That's a new command? Yeah, because you don't get it. Church people, you don't get it. (laughs) You're not hearing me right. Is traditions bad? No, traditions are good. Rituals bad? No, rituals are good. Rule keeping, is that bad? No, rule keeping is good. We don't want people murdering people and killing people and doing all these bad things. But he said, don't ever, he was telling his apostles, don't ever let your rule keeping take the place of how you treat people. Have you ever been to a church where they forgot? Now I'm getting real, huh? Huh? Where they, oh, they had it all together. But you feel it, don't you? That's just like, oh, can't stand it. It, it, let Let me say it this way. Some of the meanest people I've ever met are church people. Is that right? Some of the meanest people, some of you are sitting really still like, well, huh, really? You know, right? There's a reason why we don't go sometimes, and it's because don't make me go there because those people are mean. Because why? Because somewhere along the line they forgot that it's about how we treat people, not just keeping rules, see? And all of a sudden it was like, you're not like us. You don't smell like it. You're not like it. Get out. And it doesn't matter how I do it. It doesn't matter how I treat you. It doesn't matter what I do. Get it? That's why the gravitational pull is that. And Jesus said, don't ever let it become about this. The law was never meant for this. And they do that sometimes because they're scared, you see? Self-condemnation. You want to know the most terrible darkness there is? Self-condemnation. Have you ever been there? I have. The fear of exposure. And I really think that was a piece of what happened to the Pharisees. It's like, if you look bad, then I look good. You get it? They're so bad, and I'm so good. Read, read the story, right, where the, where the Pharisee's praying, and the, and the other guy's praying, and the Pharisee goes, thank you, God, that I'm not like him. Remember that? Not how good I am or how I compare or what he's like or how his journey is, but I thank you, God, that I'm not like that guy. (laughs) Um, But if we're really truthful, we're afraid of being exposed for who we are. And it's the reason why some of us avoid things. We avoid the Bible. There's reasons why people avoid the Bible. One is they don't know how to read it, and they're they're struggling with how to come up with a thing. But another reason is this. I'm afraid of what it says. Because if I come up against this, I don't know what God's going to say. I don't know what the light is going to look like, and it might expose me for who I am. They, the same thing for the church. I know some people are, are, think the church is mean, but some people project that onto the church. If I go there, they're going to judge me. Well, they're hypocrites anyway. You ever heard anybody say that? I'm not going there. They're a bunch of hypocrites. Where is that coming from? Why are you so upset? And, and the honest truth is, is they, are, they avoid God. I'm scared of what he might know about me. Because light in fact, you can write these things down if you want. Light exposes us, isn't it? You get that? Light exposes us. Let me explain. When you go out to a restaurant with your spouse or your girlfriend or whatever, what is the lighting like? Do you know? It's candlelit, right? The most romantic scenes are candlelit. Why? Because we look so much better <laughs> when it's candlelit, isn't it? Isn't that true? It's true, isn't it? Because if you take that same person and you took a spotlight and you went in a room that was just bright as could be, you'd be like, whoa, <laughs> right? I mean, it happened, Eddie, I was, I was just talking to Eddie first service. We, had, we watched the Super Bowl at his house. He's got a 70-inch flat screen, amazing. The most amazing high definition. You know you can have too much definition. <laughs> We're watching the Super Bowl and one of the announcers comes on and you can see every wrinkle in his face. And you're going... That's just too much definition. You get it? And light does that, doesn't it? It points out every flaw. If you, if you point a spotlight on something, it shines. And what are we nervous about? What is it? Light will expose us. It will expose our efforts, doesn't it? The frustration that we don't meet God's expectations, right? We're scared of that light. We're scared to come under that light. We don't meet, <laughs> we're sitting here talking about God's, we don't meet our own expectations. Is that right? How many of us? Isn't that, isn't that correct? If we were really truthful, we have our goals and we have our things, but we don't even meet our own expectations. The Apostle Paul understood it when he wrote Romans chapter 7, 15. He says this, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, I do. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not good. I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This is what I am doing. Now, if I do what I want to do... And what to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin living within me that does it. Don't ask me to read that again. Good night. But do you get it? 
Is that how it feels? The good I want to do, I can't. I can't quite grasp it. Light exposes that I want to do this, but I can't. And I keep, some of you can really write this, I keep falling back into the same old traps. I keep saying I'm going to do better. I keep saying that I got self-control, I'm going to keep the faith, I'm going to do this, but I keep slipping back. I keep slipping back. You see where the equation's not working? You get it? You see why this is so important? Light exposes our failure, doesn't it? It exposes our failure, our immaturity of our faith. Ooh, that's hard, isn't it? The immaturity of our faith that we think that we could do it in our own strength, because many of us do, and we're trying, we're striving, we're trying. And isn't that a good thing to strive? It is, but, but we're missing it because Jesus is saying you can't even do it because you have to be born again. You have to be a different person to live the life that I have. You can't do this in, a, in, in your own strength. You can only do it with me. Faith is born from above. Isn't that what he said? Spirit gives birth to spirit. And, and Nicodemus is going, what? It's exposed your lack of dependence upon God. It's exposed the inability to draw from God's power. You ever felt like that? You ever felt like this power just wasn't there? Like, I'm going along and I'm trying to do all these things, but, but the energy's not there. The joy's not there. My life isn't what it's supposed to be. And light reveals that. So far, it's been pretty negative, right? You go, hey, man, you're bringing us all down. Light is bad, right? I mean, I think I'm starting to light darkness a little bit better now. I understand why I'm hiding, and some of us are hidden in the darkness because we don't really understand all that it reveals. And now is where Jesus takes a turn in in the conversation. And I believe this is where Nicodemus' life started to change. I really do. Because he switches gears. And he goes, the light reveals your need, but it also reveals God's love. And that's kind of a strange thought to a Pharisee. Well, if I don't add up, then how does that reveal God's love? And he does so in John 3.16. And because it's one of the most quoted verses in all the Bible, oftentimes we miss it because of what it says. It says, for God so loved the world. Right above that, you can write your name if you want. It's kind of helpful. God so loved you. When he says the world, what do you think of the world? For those of you that read the Bible, what does he think of the world? Good or bad? Right? The world system, how does he think of that? The people that are in it, are they sinners or saints? You know, Are they good or bad? So, so when he says, I love the world, it means that, what? It means without condition means I love you even though you're broken. I I love you even though you hate me. That's not conditional, is it? That's the most amazing thing in the world when somebody says, I love you, and you go, I hate you. And they go, yeah, but I still love you. Kind of takes you back, doesn't it? How do you know that? Because of what happened in the life of Christ. This hadn't happened in the time of Nicodemus, but he was explaining it to him. And he said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and and he's explaining an analogy where where they looked up and they they were saved, he said, I will be lifted up. That was a type of me coming, and I'm going to die for your sin. You, because you're broken. You're separated from God. I could spend more time talking about separation from God. I haven't found the need in our congregation. But if you need help with that, if you're going, I'm I'm good. I don't think I'm separated from God. I haven't felt the devastating consequences of sin in my life. Come see me. We'll help you with that. But I haven't had to spend a lot of time there because most of the people I deal with on a regular basis go, my life is devastated. I don't know that God could forgive me. I deserve to be separated from God. Yeah, we get it. How does he restore that? And he goes, because I'm paying for it myself. That's what the cross of Christ is all about. The blood of Christ is to pay for that. That's not a little problem. (laughs) It's not, it's not an easy fix. If it were, he wouldn't have had to go to the cross. Is that right? And on the cross, he paid for all the sin that's ever been, including yours. And he loved you so much that he died. But what I want you to understand is this. He loved you so much that he died before he got your answer. Does that make sense? Your f- sins were future then, weren't they? And he said, I know what you'll do because I'm God. And I know I'm worth more than everyone because I am part of the Godhead. And I will give my life for you. And you can reject me, but I want to make sure you know, even if you spend eternity separated from me, I still love you. And 
I will pay for it. Is that love? Maybe you never realized that, and I give it to you freely. There's nothing you can do to earn it. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to fix it. And, and God's light will reveal to you that he loves you. Even though God's light will reveal what you are. <laughs> Even though it reveals all your chinks, it reveals your separation, it reveals that we're sinners and we can't do this and that our equation doesn't add up, it breaks through the darkness and says, I love you right where you are. So if you're there today, please hear the words of Christ. These are not my words, these are his. He goes on in verse 17 to say what? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Meaning that Jesus didn't come to condemn you, he came to save you. Maybe you thought all your life that God's against you. Maybe you think he sent Jesus to be the cosmic inspector. Anybody? I need to inspect your life to see if you add up. You don't. You don't. I get joy. No. He already knows you don't add up. That's why he came. He didn't come to condemn you because you're already condemned. He came to take your place. You get it? He's not waiting for you to fail. He's not waiting for you to strike you down. It showed us the side of God that people didn't know up until then. They kept thinking he is impersonal. He doesn't, I don't know if he loves us. I don't know how he feels about us until Christ came and he said, I am the image of the invisible God. If you want to know what God is like, you see me. If you want to know what the Father is like, you have seen him because you've seen me. I am not the Father, but the Father, everything I do reflects the Father, and everything that I do reflects Him, and vice versa. <laughs> and He goes, so I want you to know what I'm like. I love you. And I love you enough to pay for your sins when you don't deserve it, when you know you should be condemned. I want to give you a different equation, you see? I think that's what He's saying. If you're spiritually stuck, this is good math. This will change your life. And it's not just knowing it. It's really receiving it that changes the life. But, but maybe we need to write it down. Christianity, what is it? It's not what you do. It's not legalism or works. It's Christ plus salvation. It's through Jesus Christ alone that we receive salvation. We can't do it. We cannot save ourselves. See, that's good math. That's what he's saying in these verses. That's what he's telling Nicodemus. You keep striving so hard, Nicodemus, but you're far from it. And if you want to be forgiven, what equals forgiveness? Love plus grace. Through God's grace alone, through Jesus Christ alone, that's how we're saved. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You didn't deserve it. That's why it's forgiveness. <laughs> and he paid the price through his own blood. Not behavior plus performance. Is it not important what I do? We'll get to that. It is important what we do. Our works matter. Our works will count for all of eternity, but they are not the basis of our salvation or being right with God. Only He can pay for that. The final thing is this, is faith. We can't keep the faith <laughs> on our own. Faith has to do with this. You want to know what faith is? You want to know what the equation is for faith? Surrender plus freedom. Maybe you never thought of it that way. The first step is really the first step. If you want faith, it means you have to surrender to God. I am powerless over my sin. I am powerless over my situation, and I have to surrender to God to restore me. It's a fact. And some people want to hold on to themselves. That's what happened with the Pharisees. But Nicodemus broke away from that, and he thought to himself... Maybe there's another way, and he was willing to humble himself enough to say, if you want freedom, you know how you do it? Surrender. That sounds so weird, doesn't it? Usually, surrender doesn't mean freedom, does it? But if you want freedom, he says, who can set you free? If the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. You will be free if you surrender to me. Your life, your stuff, your sin. If you do that today, he'll come in. And he'll save you. From what? From your sin. That your relationship with God might be restored. Is it perfect? No. We'll get to that too. <laughs> but he will perfectly restore your relationship with God. He will transform your life. And from that day on, it'll be different. You want that? 
Call out to him in your own words, and he will save you. I'd be remiss if I didn't offer that to you. If you need help with that, you come see us. It's the most amazing story in the entire Bible. Hold on to John chapter 3. It is the most amazing revelation about God that I've ever known. Because God is holy and God is just and God is all of those things. But that's not what endears us to God. Because he could be all those things and say, I want nothing to do with you. What endears us to God is his everlasting love that he says, you know what? I'm all those things and I still love you personally. Maybe you needed to hear that today. That's what will get you unstuck. So where do we go from there? If you've accepted Christ right now, where do you go from there? If you've been here a long time, where do you go from there? Because believe it or not, I got a feeling that the unsaved person or the person that hasn't started following Christ yet, you're not the only one stuck. <laughs> and so how do we get past that? So here, here's the other thing light does. After we've received Christ, light draws us from the past. If you want to know what it draws us out of, it draws us out of the past. What are you saying? After you receive Christ, leave the past in the past. Not easy, is it? Some of us are living in the past. Some of us have never gotten past the stuff. Christ says he'll forgive us, yet we're still holding on to that baggage. I'm a worm, I'm terrible, I can't never get past this, I can't ever live up to this, or, or I'm living with one foot in the world and one foot in the church and I'm trying to drag all this stuff with me. You get it? And he's going, stop. You have a new life in Christ, now take it, use it, and put the past in the past. If anybody understood that, it was the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. He had done all the things that you would think of a Pharisee. He was a zealot. He was just as much a terrorist as any terrorist that we know today. He killed Christians in horrible ways to make them recant their faith. That was the Apostle Paul. But he came to faith in Christ, and here's what he said. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, Don't maybe you need to write that down. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. <laughs> I know the verse. I, I looked at it for effect. Because why? Circle it. You find that in your Bible, right? Philippians 3, 13. Do not forget forgetting what is behind. I had an old life. I did horrible things. But if I want to press towards the mark... You mean to be saved? No. He is saved. <laughs> to present my life to God, to live out the works that I need to do, I need to receive God's forgiveness, and that requires me to forget what is behind. Forget the past. Leave the past in the past and press towards what God has for me. And that's a challenge for the church family too, guys. Can I tell you what the church is known for? <laughs> Shooting its wounded. It should never have been that way, but it is. What do you mean? I mean, sometimes we have a hard time letting people keep the past in the past. Isn't that right? They come in, and you know what they did? Oh, you better not come in here. You know, or, 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 or better yet, a Christian, you, when you come to faith in Christ, we love these testimonies that the person was lost, and they're terrible, and all this stuff. And they come to faith, and now they're perfect. <laughs> and when they all of a sudden don't turn out perfect, because none of us are, right? Then we go, let me boot you, right? Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. Am I saying you, because some people get really mad about this. Well, isn't there church discipline? Yeah. Doesn't the Apostle Paul also say that you should turn them over to Satan for a season? If they're, if they're not following Christ, he does. Maybe you didn't know I knew that verse. I do. <laughs> that you should practice discipline, that, 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 if, that if you can't resolve this, that, that, that you separate and you treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. That's correct. Let me ask you a question. How do you treat a pagan or tax collector? Let me, let, me, let me say it a different way. How did Jesus treat pagans and tax collectors? Huh? Did he make them his inner circle? No. <laughs> did, did he say, we should make them leaders in the church? No, not until they change, but we pray for them. We reach out to them. We don't shoot the wounded. We love them. We care about them. And yes, there's a separation for a time. Yes, there is some hard love. And yes, there is a time that we do that. But hear me out, guys. 
the church should never be known for, well, you were a Christian, and now you acted like that, so you need to go away. We don't want to deal with that, see? And there's tons of people all over the place, broken as can be, because the church doesn't get it. we got to rise up and understand, forget the past, help them leave the past. In the past, we need to be, make, help make a path to get away from that. Hey, I found the path. Come with me. You get it? That's what the church needs to be about. So we need to leave the past in the past. By what? The other thing is this. We need to surrender control. Surrender control. If we, if it, the light draws us to surrender control over the past, the present, and the future. The illusion that we have is this, is that we actually think that we're in control. And some of us understand that. You know when we think we're in control when things are going good? Isn't that right? It's true. When things are going good, you go, let me tell you what I did to get here. You know, we got books written on this stuff. When things are bad, then it's not our fault. Isn't that right? <laughs> when things are bad, it's, oh gosh, you know, that's everybody else. It's, it's somebody else's problem. And I'm not saying we don't take responsibility, but we need to be very careful with this particular thing in Christianity. Because some of us think that our circumstances are based solely on our faith. So if we have good circumstances, we must have good faith. You get it? If we have bad circumstances, it must mean we have bad faith. If something bad is happening, and, and, and some of you know what I'm talking about, that's how we feel. And I can tell you we need to shatter this paradigm. It is a heresy that is killing us in the church. Because we have all kinds of disillusioned Christians because they're running around thinking, well, I must not, if, if, if your circumstances haven't changed, you know what the answer is? You don't have enough faith. Can I tell you that's a lie from the pit of hell? And it is devastating some people's lives, and I've seen it. And I watch them, and they're, and they're killing themselves, going, I don't know what to do because I'm in these circumstances. Let me help you with that today. Some of us are scared to death. Isn't that right? Some of us are coming in here today, and we're scared to death of our circumstances. And we don't know how we got there, and we're looking up to God going, how could this be? Anybody there? Anybody saying that? Some of us are facing joblessness. Is that right? Some of us, our job has run out. Some of us are facing prodigal children. That's one of the hardest things in the world, isn't it? I raised them this way, but then they turned out this way, and now they're gone, and they're doing these things, and, and it's killing me. And God, where are you in this, you know? Some of us are facing illness, right? Some of us are facing loss of people in our lives. Some, some of us are facing some really, really difficult things, you know, right? Some of us are struggling with a government that can't get it together, right? Republicans in the House, Democrats in the Senate. <laughs> they can't come together and they can't figure this thing out. And, and, and Christians are running around like this. You know what I'm talking about? Oh! And they're not telling God, they're telling me. You know? <laughs> you get it? Ah! The boat's sinking! You get it? It's true. But I want to tell you this today. I don't know where you find yourself, and I would never dream of telling you why God has put you in the circumstances that he has. That's between you and God. I would never dream of telling you what God's plan is for that. But I will tell you this. I believe that Jesus Christ wants to take you to a place where your faith can overwhelm your fears. And I believe that Christians need to hear this, guys. Not just unsaved people. If you're unsaved and you're coming to faith in Christ today, you need to hear this too. But if you're a follower of Christ, you need to hear this. This isn't for somebody else. This is for you. Your faith should overwhelm your fears. And if you're running around like, ah, <laughs> this is for you, guys. How do you do it? Romans chapter 8 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, shall hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or sword, or danger? There's two sides of this, you see. The one side is, is nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. The other side of it is, is you're going to face these things in this life. And sometimes we don't say that. It's like, no, it's going to be great. It's good. You're, he's going to get out. He's going to deliver you from every, all these things. No, he will ultimately deliver you from But he said, none of these things will separate you, meaning you will probably go through them. There's an illustration in the Bible. There's a story in the Bible. We've used it before, and some of you might be going, why are we using it again? Because some of us have heard it, but we haven't really heard it. You know what I mean? Including me. We have to come back to it. And it's this one. Jesus sent his disciples out on a boat. 
And he said, go to the other side, and I'll, I'll meet you there, I guess. And he went up and he prayed on the mountain. And as he was praying, a storm came. And the disciples were out in the boat. Has anybody ever been in a storm on a boat? It's quite the experience. If you've been in a storm in a small boat, it's quite amazing, isn't it? When you can't see land and lightning is striking the water and the boat feels like it's going to capsize and the waves are bigger than you can imagine and you go, what, how do we get out here and why don't we have life jackets? No, that's a different story. And, <laughs> and they're going, we can't swim and they didn't have life jackets then and they're going, what are we going to do and we're going to die and they look out and they go, it's a ghost. <laughs> they don't believe in ghosts. They're followers of Jesus but yet they see a ghost walking out on the water and who is it? It's not a ghost. It's Jesus walking on the water. water. And Jesus isn't frantic. Jesus isn't scared. He's not running to them going, oh. He's walking on the storm. You get the picture? And then Peter, who we talked about the first message in the series, he, he, he looks out and he goes, can I do that? <laughs> and Jesus is like, yeah, sure, come on out. And, and he comes out of the boat and it, literally for a minute he walks on the water like Jesus. Isn't that amazing? And then... He looks around, and he's like, oh, wow. Kind of like Wile E. Coyote, you know. He's like, I didn't know I was walking out. And then, and I can see all the kids don't know who that is, but that's fine. And, and, and it's like, and he starts to fall, right? And he says, Lord, save me. And Jesus, here's what it says he did. You can, you can go back and look it up. Matthew 14, 30. But when he saw the wind and he was afraid, he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand. And he caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? This is an interesting story. See, Peter was looking at Christ and he was walking on the water and everything was going along good. Some of you might be able to relate to this story, really. Life is going along good. You get the picture? <laughs> Everything's going fine. And all of a sudden you look and it's like, oh. I didn't see that wave. I didn't see this wind. I didn't see this stuff. And I can't believe this has happened in my life. And you start to sink and you're going, Lord, save me. Anybody there today? Save me. I'm scared. You get it? And Jesus, I want you to pay attention to the sequence here. He caught him. And then he said, you have little faith. Be careful with this. A lot of people think it's Jesus going this. I'm going to help you, but mm -mm. that's not it at all, guys. It's like this. Peter is looking at the waves and sinking. You ever had that feeling? We're not going to make this. <laughs> and he's falling and Jesus caught him. You get it? And he's with Peter right there going, Peter, you don't have enough faith here. Because you're focused on all this. You get it? Why did you doubt? You see, you see what I think God is saying to us today? You, you see the same picture? You're facing all this, and you're going, but the storm. And he's going, yeah, yeah, I know. I know about the storm. But why are you afraid? But, but, but you don't understand what's going on. But yeah, no, 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 I, I get it. I'm Jesus. I get it. I'm not surprised. I'm walking on it. Notice what he didn't do. He didn't calm it until they were back in the boat, by the way. He did not calm the storm and say, now you have faith because you can stop the storm. He walked on it. And he's calling us as Christians not just to be delivered from it sometimes. Sometimes he does. He can calm a storm. He didn't have to allow the storm. You think he was shocked by the storm? He's saying, I want you to rise above it and not live under it. And how do you do that? By not focusing on the storm. This might be the greatest lesson you will ever have in your life. If you want to have a faith that Jesus wants to take you to, that overwhelms your fear, you're going to have to get your eyes off of your circumstances and get them on Jesus. Because if you are dependent upon your circumstances, you're going to go up and down and up and down. And some of you are going, wait a minute, I am doing that. Right? I know, I do it too. And he's saying, no, I want to give you a faith that overwhelms your fear. And in order to do that, you know what you got to do? you got to look at me. Now, here's what it is not. Some of us are going to hear this all wrong, and I've done it, and, and, and it's not going to work, and you're going to be completely devastated. And then you'll remember what I said. This is not lesson one, fear not. Okay? Be careful. Be careful. You're going to think that, you know, okay, I got lesson one, fear not. Now what? That's not how it works. You know how many times he said fear not in the Bible? 
over 365 times. In fact, I think it is 365 times. Is that unusual that it's one for every day of the week? So it is not lesson one, fear not. It is today, fear not. Tomorrow, fear not. You're going to have to keep coming back and focusing because when you see these storms, and you will, they will scare you to death, and they should if you're by yourself. But if you're looking at Jesus who is walking on the thing that you fear the most, (laughs) you can have victory, guys. And you know how you do it? By following him every day. Every day. It's a daily thing. Salvation once and for all. Following Christ That is every day, guys. And it starts by surrendering every day. Every day you got to reboot. Every day you got to focus on Him. Every day you got to give it to Him. That's how it works. The light draws us out of our past, the light draws us to the present. How does it do that? To pursue obedience. That's one of the things. If you want to, if you want to let the draw light draw you to the present where you where he God has you today, it drawing you to be obedient in Him. The light of the Word of God draws us to take the next step of obedience. That's what it means. Not the 10,000 steps. It's what's the next step that God has for you. The steps that are ordered by the Lord. What is the next right thing for you to do? See, Too many people focus on everything else. But he's saying, what is the next right thing? Let me tell you how you know. What is the last thing that God is, what is the last thing you know that God is asking you to do that you haven't done yet? That's what you need to do. (laughs) Well, that's not all that important. Well, that's not all that, I don't want to do that, you know. We all feel that way, right? That's how we know it's from God, because it's not something we would naturally do. But you got to take it step by step. He's, he's interested in people that are faithful in the small things. Do that, and then we'll do the next thing. Aim for that goal, but you're not getting there today. You're taking one more step in that direction. You get it? That's how Christianity works. That's how following Christ works. For some of us, the next step is what? Have you ever been water baptized? Well, that's not important. It is. It doesn't save you. No, it doesn't. But it is a command of Christ, and if you're not willing to take the small step of water baptism to publicly profess your faith in Christ, what are you doing? Maybe you've never been water baptized. I'm not here to beat you up. I'm saying find out what it means and be part of that. October 20th, we're going to have a baptism. If you haven't done it, come do it. It'll be amazing. And he'll use that in the life of other people. The other thing is this. You need other people around you to do this. Maybe you haven't really been part. Maybe, Maybe you need to be part of this. We got a members class coming up October the 22nd. We're not just I'm not just putting these steps in your way to go these are the only ways or new branches is the only way but plug in somewhere guys. If it's not here then find a place but if it is here then plug in. Come to the members class October 22nd. It's a Tuesday, an hour and a half. We'll answer all your questions. No. <laughs> we'll try. Community group. You need it. You need a group of people around you. Men's group. We have a men's meeting next Saturday. Come be part of it. You need to be around a group of men. Maybe you never connected. You go, I don't know how that's going to help. It's one step in the right direction. You're not going to connect next Saturday. Can I, can I help with that delusion? It's going to take time. <laughs> well, you can come and eat breakfast. We can all do that. We can come hang out, and then we know somebody, and then eventually it turns into these relationships that God wants us to have. You get it? That's how it works. Doing your part. What has God designed you to do? This isn't just about getting volunteers. You can sign up for something if you know what you need to sign up. But, but do you know what God's designed you to do? We're having a class, a ministry class, October 29th. It's four weeks on a Tuesday for an hour and a half each Tuesday. And then we're going to tell you everything God knows. We're not going to do that. <laughs> but we can still help start to piece together some of the puzzle pieces that say, this is how God's designed me, and then God will help you discover what your gift is and where you need to plug in at. So if you don't know, come be part of it. It'd be great. Whatever God is asking you to do, surrender control to him. So light draws us to the present to pursue obedience, and it draws us to the present to maintain focus. The Apostle Paul uses the illustration of a race many times, and that's what it's like. It's like a marathon. And he says this in Hebrews chapter 12, and you can go back and read it for yourself. In fact, I recommend reading the whole chapter. Hebrews chapter 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with the perseverance the race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. There's a pattern here. The race that we run for God is not a sprint, it's a marathon. That's what he's saying. And we throw off the things that are holding us back, the sin that so easily entangles us. You get it? 
Leaving the past in the past, letting us get victory. Not living with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. Not one foot with God and one foot in the world. We toss that off because a runner doesn't hold on to anything he doesn't need when he's running. And it takes perseverance is what it says. How? To fix your eyes on Jesus. And some of you today are stuck right here. You've accepted Christ and you're stuck because you've fallen, haven't you? And you don't think you can get back up. You go, well, I was running and then I fell and now that's it. And he's going, I'm sorry, this takes perseverance, guys. <laughs> this, ain't, this ain't a 100-yard dash. This is a 26-mile marathon. <laughs> and you're at marker two. Get up. And how do you run a marathon? You look to the prize, but be careful with this. You look to the prize, and then you concentrate on today. Hmm. There it is. Fix my eyes on Jesus. I'm coming to you. And then... This is the step that i got to take today, one step at a time. I can't focus on tomorrow. I focus on today. Isn't that what Jesus said? These these aren't my words. These are his. A day has enough trouble of its own. Isn't that what he said? Do not worry about tomorrow, for a day has enough trouble of its own. You get it? Focus on me and take the next step, and then I'll be there when you take the next one. And that's how it works, guys. And the joy set before him, that's how he endured. You've got to focus on the right thing and then make it daily. It's huge. Jesus closed his teaching with Nicodemus with this. Verse 21, But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. (laughs) Do you know what he's saying here? He's saying the light is not about me. The light is not about you. It's about God. It always has been. And if you miss this part, then you're going to miss what life is all about because it's not going to work. When you step out of the darkness and into the light, and you discover that the spotlight of God is not on you, it's not. It's on God working through you. Can you write that down? It's a fact. And it's, it's the lesson, and I'm telling you, the reason why Nicodemus is such an amazing study is because Nicodemus got it. He understood it. You might not even know that Nicodemus was mentioned again in the Bible. He was. John 19, 38. You know where he's found? At the tomb. Maybe you know about the tomb. When Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, and he was buried, and and, and now that we know, we don't mind saying it, Jesus was buried awaiting resurrection to prove to the entire world that he is God, and he did. The very tomb that he stayed in was by a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. And you know who paid for most of the stuff? Nicodemus. I didn't know that. I didn't either. I never thought about it. Except for one thing. The spotlight of God was not on Nicodemus. It was on Christ. And Nicodemus got it. I got to be part of the greatest thing in the history of mankind, putting the Savior of the world in the tomb while he waits resurrection so that the entire world might be saved. And I got to be part of that. And you don't know my name. (laughs) Did you know that about him? (laughs) A little disappointing, isn't it? And they won't know it about you either. Be careful that you don't think that the spotlight of God is for you to get the credit. It's not, Christian. It's for something far Greater than that for God to do a work in you to reach a lost and dying world. Can we form a church around that? What would that be like? Here's my challenge for you today. God so loved the world so that we could love the light again. (laughs) We don't have to be scared of the light because of Christ. And my challenge to you today is this. Will you humble yourself and step up into the light right now? What's keeping you from the light? Are you afraid? You don't have to be. And it will change your life. Let's stand for prayer. Father, this passage of Scripture... John chapter 3 is the most amazing passage I have ever read. (laughs) It is the most life-changing thing we will ever see 
because it tells us something about you, Lord. There was years that I thought you were impersonal. There was years that I didn't understand you. And this tells me, God, that you are holy and you are righteous and you are just and that you love us. And that doesn't add up to me, but it adds up to you because of Jesus Christ who shed his own blood for us. Even while we hated him. I will never get over that as long as I live. Thank you for drawing us to you. I pray for the person right now, God, in their own words, I pray that they call out to you, the one that's broken, that came here today and goes, I didn't understand anything until right now I feel the presence of God drawing me to him. And I don't know what to do, but I need to surrender to God. I pray that they do today, Lord. In their own words, to call out to you and, and ask you to forgive their sins and come into their heart and save them. I pray for that right now, God. Then I pray for the Christian, Lord, that's scared to death. Underneath their circumstances, Lord, what are they doing there? <laughs> some of us are facing some hard circumstances. And God, I just believe I see the image of Jesus walking on whatever it is that they fear. And he's reaching his hand down and he's saying, why are you afraid? <laughs> I am with you, no matter what. And that today we might leave as Christians that aren't dependent on our circumstances anymore. Because daily we can come to you. Moment by moment we can come to you. <laughs> we can fix our eyes on you. And ultimately, Lord, it's not about us. It's about you. That the spotlight of God isn't on us. It's on your work in us. That we might be able to reach a lost and dying world while there's still time. <laughs> you receive all the honor and the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, if you need prayer today, we're going to be up here to pray with you. For everybody else, please turn in your Connect cards on the way out. God bless you. Have a great week.